Okay. Now, I'll go through this quickly, but I want you to understand our research protocol because I see a lot of misunderstandings in the popular press about near-death experiences, which we specifically addressed uh, in, our, in our study. What we were looking for at Seattle Children's Hospital were children who were in good health, nearly died for whatever reason, and then were returned to good health. That is really rare. We had to look over 400 charts in over a 15-year period to find our 26 children. We studied half of our children going backwards, which is not as good from a scientific standpoint, called a retrospective study. And we studied half of our children going forwards, uh, which is the gold standard or a prospective study. And we didn't ask these children, children, did you see God? Did you see a beautiful light or any of that kind of thing? I'm a practicing pediatrician. I often say to children things like, uh, do you have a monkey in your ear? Guess what? Most children say yes. <laughs> Dramatic proof of a race of tiny simians in children's ears. You know, no. Children and adults want to please the powerful people in their lives. And to ask someone who's nearly died, did you see God? Think about it. That puts an expectation. They're going to say, yes, I did see God. So we didn't ask those kinds of questions. In fact, we had a very strict research protocol. We had 16 questions we could ask. And they were all along the lines of, tell me what you remember about being in the hospital. As bland and as open-ended as that. Furthermore, our study was titled, The Psychological Sequelae of Surviving Intensive Care Unit Management. Deliberately so, because we, wanted, we didn't want to alert anyone uh, as to uh, the true uh, subtext of our investigation. So our study, I've just told you, is a good study. Okay, and here are the kinds of people we looked at. Cardiac arrest survivors, coma survivors, patients with diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, that's a patient that had a blood sugar of over 3,000 associated with a very high mortality rate. The, the medical, everyone groan please, because the medical audiences I usually speak to, they all go, oh, okay. All right, then we compared these children to a control group of critically ill children who thought they were going to die, whose parents thought they were going to die and yet survive given today's medical care unit technology. And we deliberately picked these subjects to look at the types of issues that people with near-death experiences are interested in. Spe specifically, we looked at patients who had extremely low oxygen levels to their brain. We looked at patients who had very high carbon dioxide levels in their brain. We looked at patients who were narcotic overdoses, drug overdoses, anesthetic agents, elective surgery. Um, post-cardiac surgery. And we looked at hundreds and hundreds of controls because our statisticians told us that with a group of only 26 experimental patients, we needed hundreds of controls. So as best we could, we got these two groups, the really sick and the kind of sick. And we tried to, everything else we tried to keep the same. same. And I've told you about our protocol already. We asked very bland, open-ended questions. And our results were amazing. Virtually every child that we interviewed who survived cardiac arrest described some fragment of what people call near-death experiences. None of our control group, none of the people who thought they were going to die, who were deeply religious, whose parents thought they were going to die, who had a lack of oxygen to their brain, who had every kind of med you can think of on board, who were intubated, mechanically ventilated, who survived the psychological stresses of a scary intensive care unit. Those patients didn't confabulate or invent the experience. Those patients fit within the framework of conventional neurology. Those patients just said, I don't remember being at the hospital. That's it. I don't remember. Pa patients who survived cardiac arrest told us something quite different. What they told us fit precisely with what Ken Ring has already identified in adults as being a near-death experience. The sense of peace, the bodily separation, entering into darkness, seeing the light, and entering into the light. Here's a nice example of that. There's a 10-year-old boy uh, who nearly drowned. You can't see very well. I'm going to have a close-up picture for you in a minute. The top left are hands 
plunging into his body at the point of death to pull him out. He then enters into darkness. The darkness dissolves into a light. And then there's heaven for him as a pup tent in a golden field. This boy is a Boy Scout. That's heaven for him. Okay, so Susan Blackmore's great theory, great theory. I, Susan Blackmore is a lot smarter than me. Um, nevertheless, her great theory does not match with the clinical information we got from patients. The darkness clearly is the cessation of bodily function. The darkness, in case after case, represents the lack of input from the eyes, the ears, etc., etc. Let's talk about that pup tent for a moment. This patient saw heaven as a pup tent in a golden field. That's heaven to this patient. So obviously, what you consider to be heaven comes from your own mind. This is the part that's the hardest to understand. For those of you who think that heaven is an objectively real place south of Jupiter, our research does not support that. They, it doesn't. Every person we interview has a different view of heaven. One child told us that when she was in the um, tunnel, there was a lamb was with her. We thought a lamb, that's a weird thing. Maybe, well, isn't there some kind of Christian imagery about a lamb, etc., etc.? Hmm. When she was two years old, she had a favorite lammy. That was her lamb. That was her comfort item. I wrote the foreword to a book uh, written by Betty Eady, a Mormon. And a lot of people really loved that book. But a lot of people hated it. And they wrote me letters about it. And here's what they hated. They hated because in Betty Eady's dying experience, her experience didn't match what they thought their dying experience was going to be like. Specifically, her book seemed to disagree with some other book that they had read. Some, you know, like their Bible, you know, or whatever their, their book was. You know, I, I don't know what to say about that. I can only tell you that people who have, who were outraged at Betty Eady's book, which I thought was beautiful, would also be outraged at this guy's story. Because I'll bet you that your book and your Bible doesn't have that when you go to heaven, you're going to sit in a pup tent in a golden field. <laughs> the other side of it is this, though. If you can somehow wean yourself from that type of thinking, consider this. When you die, you're going to go to a warm, comforting place accompanied by people who have meaning to you to a heaven that means something to you. And that's a beautiful thing. That's a really beautiful thing. Here's what I've learned from near-death experiences. If my wife dies before me, I'm going to see her again when I die. That's a beautiful thing. You know, I can't imagine the, the grief of losing my wife. But I know that that idea, something that is clear, from any interpretation of near-death research, that that will happen, and that all of us die in this way. Here's those hands I was telling you about. Amazing. People will talk about, I'll talk about the transformation in a moment where you think that people that have this experience, they have, their brains are activated to a higher level. Um, this is 12 years old when he wrote, when he drew this. Those are the hands. See, no silver cord, no tunnel. Because those are cultural elements. The silver cord was at the turn of the century. Everyone saw silver cords back then. Now everyone sees tunnels. Well, this boy didn't read about silver cords or tunnels, and so it was hands for him. Here's heaven for him uh, as well. Notice that that rainbow is a constant, and they always call it the light. Here's heaven for this boy. And these children's experiences, remember we asked them, tell us anything about a near-death experience. That, you know, tell us anything, but by near-death experience, we just meant what happened to you when you died. If they were saying, well, I was at home with my mommy having cocoa, that we would have recorded as a near-death experience. Interestingly enough, they didn't. They described what is, in our common mythology, a near-death experience, the out-of-body experience. 
Here's a kind of out-of-body experience I can understand. He wishes he was out of his body. Here's just the out-of-body experience that my patients describe. This is the, uh, the English mystic William Blake. The soul hovering preoccupied with its own body. Here's an adult who uh, drew this, uh, painted this. You can see now almost, I mean, it's almost identical. You can see sort of the, the separation of forms there. It's the woman below and the sort of spirit figure above. Here it is from a uh, child's perspective. We're now looking down. This is a child that nearly died of diabetic ketoacidosis. She, there's also a figure that's off of the screen there. Uh, she said there was two women doctors at her bedside and they were wearing green masks. It's amazing how they get all these little details correct. Um, that's not a detail that she's confabulating from cultural mythology that two women doctors with green masks would have been there. That in fact was quite accurate. She was attended by two uh, female residents and they mistakenly thought she had bacterial meningitis when she presented and uh, they wore masks. She has no IV. That is correct. They could not get an IV in her. Then they enter into darkness. Here's a nice example of that. Where this is a young boy that died of a condition uh, uh, called uh, tracheomalacia um, and was resuscitated. Um, he's floating out of his physical body. You can see on the bottom right there, those are the hospital rooms. He's sort of rising up above them. And then he thinks he's going towards that dark tunnel there. And there's his uh, mother and his grandmother in the waiting room uh, crying. Then they travel in this tunnel. Uh, this is the first girl I told you about. Uh, so she says that this is a spirit guide named Kim Katie, um, who took her uh, through this tunnel to a place she thought was heaven. Uh, this is a young boy who uh, had uh, several cardiac arrests from a condition called malignant hyperthermia from a routine tonsillectomy. He said, forget my body, forget being alive. I just wanted to get to that light at the end of that tunnel. And then here's the picture he drew of that. And then they see a light. Here's a nice example of the tunnel in the, in the light. You can see that dark tunnel and it looks almost like a cigarette tip. And he almost felt he was in another world. You can see a br brightly lit, almost like something out of uh, Plato's uh, The Cave. And then for those of you who think that this light is some irritation of the occipital lobe or some, you know, like the stars you see on your head uh, when you're hit on your head, this young girl here wants to tell you this light is filled with love. You can see the rainbow has all kinds of hearts on it. It's anchored by two hearts. And then we see two spirit beatings here with hearts for tails. So it's a light that has a, lo a lot of love in it. And then this decision to return The decision to return, only described here in America. In India, they don't have a decision to return. India is a very bu bureaucratic society. In uh, India, it's primarily seen as a, it's a mistake. We don't have you in our book. Um, we went to uh, Japan, studied 400 Japanese near-death experiences. We never heard a decision to return. I work with the University of our Rwanda, which unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. Um, we uh, um, got about 30 uh, native African near-death experiences uh, from psychiatrists we work with there. We never heard a decision to return. I'm emphasizing that because I think it's one of the most painful aspects of our current cultural understanding of near-death experiences. Because after all, if these children decided to return, if you've had a child who's died, why didn't my child decide to return? And as you're going to see, these experiences are a very complex mixture of cultural psychology, personal psychology, and something else. Um, communication with God, perhaps. <laughs> 